Hi everyone, welcome to Molecular Devices webinar on novel in vitro assay tools for cardiac toxicity and discovery. My name is Deborah Gornet and I am the product manager for the assays and reagent kits product family molecular devices. I will be your host today. Assessing cardiac toxicity is important during the early stages of drug discovery to eliminate potentially toxic compounds from further development. Highly predictive biologically relevant in vitro assays Suitable for high throughput screening are critical to improve efficiencies and reduce the high cost associated with compounds that fail during cardiac safety assessment. Stem cell dramatic cardiomyocytes are an especially attractive cell model because they express GPCRs and ion channels while demonstrating spontaneous mechanical and electrical activity similar to native cardiac cells. Today's speakers will present an overview of the advancements in fluorescence-based methods for identifying cardiotoxic compounds in a bioirrelevant assay using IPS derived cardiomyocytes with a new early toxic cardiotoxicity kit. Characterization of concentration dependent modulation of calcium peak frequency and atypical feed patterns by representative compounds will be illustrated. Additionally, assay methods and statistical analysis for prediction of cardiotoxicity using our cardioactive compound library will be presented. We're pleased to have Carol Crittenden and Dr. Sana Sarenko, both of Molecular Devices, join us today. A little bit about our speakers before we move on. Carol is a graduate of Oral Roberts University. She began her career at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, working first in the compatibility lab and later performing research on the effects of growth factors on hematopoietic progenitor development. Later, she worked at biotechnologies companies such as Cell Therapeutics and Melegenetics, where she held positions including drug discovery researchers and core tissue culture lab manager. During this time, she developed assays for screening for anti-cancer compounds and for compounds that affect GPCRs using a flipper instrument. In 2002, Carol moved from being a flipper customer to Molecular Devices as a marketing application scientist for the flipper product line. Today, she continues to support GPCR and ion channel application development, in addition to developing new areas of applications for flipper systems, reagent kits, and other molecular devices products. The title of her talk today will be Novel in Vitro Assay Tools for Cardiac Toxicity and Discovery. A scholar received her PhD in biochemistry from the Institute Academy of Sciences of the Ukraine, followed by postdoctoral training at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In 2000, she started her career in biotech in the Silicon Valley, working on stem cell biology at Systemic Company. Later, her work focused on assay development for compound and genomic screening, first at Bayer and later at Fibrogen. In 2009, she joined molecular devices as a scientist in the research and development group. And here, she has focused on developing new applications for cell-based assays particularly those involving stem cells, for a variety of the instrument platforms and assay kits at molecular devices. The title of the talk today will be High Throughput Assessment of Drug Toxicity Using IPSC-Derived Cardiomyocytes. <clears throat> Following the presentation, we will conclude today's webinar with a question and answer session. You can feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, to access the Q&A window while in full screen mode, like locate the iPod tray generally at the top of your screen and click on the icon with a question mark. In the Q&A window that opens, you can type in your question and press the send button. Please include the presenter's name in your question so we can properly address your question. We'll gather questions during the two presentation sessions and following the presentation and we'll address them then at the end of both presentations. Also, please note that we will be presenting in full screen view and that there will be momentary pause between speakers to allow for the presentation control to be transferred to the next speaker. And with that, I'm going to meet the show our presenter. Okay, Carol, you should have control. Are up. So welcome to my part of the webinar. 
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. We're very excited to present to you a new kit for molecular devices, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the kit a little bit. And it's called the Early Tox Cardiotoxicity Kit. So today I'm going to give just a little introduction, and then we're going to talk about the kit for one or two slides, and then um, we're going to talk about how we use this kit with um, IPS-derived cardiomyocytes, and then a few applications and a little summary before we move on to um, Oxana. So why do we need these new assays for determining compound cardi cardiotoxicity? Cardiac toxicity is responsible for a large percentage of the new drugs that have failed in clinical trials. And um, electrophysiological methods um, have been used now to take a look at things like HERG and um, other ion channel related problems, um, but they're slow and labor intensive. And they're often reserved for just before preclinical or in the preclinical phase of drug development, which is really too late. So it would be really a good idea to have some kind of a methodology to have the ability to predict in vitro or problems early on in the assay and develop and direct um, at the high throughput screening level and direct SARs so that you can move away from those kind of compounds that are causing problems. So the cardiomyocyte um, assay using the early tox cardiotoxicity kit is really optimized for these assay, these applications. It makes it possible to look at functional profiles now in a bio-relevant um, system because the um, cardiomyocyte stem cells are so similar. They don't, they're not completely the same, but they have, share a lot of characteristics with, you know, with cardiomyocytes. And um, this makes it possible to do a safety and cardiotoxicity assay, but it also enables a drug discovery for compound effects on beat rate and also other, you know, parameters. So this dye um, has a really good um, track record now with minimal non-specific defect um, of the dye itself so that we can go longer in these assays. It also provides a good robust signal and it's suitable for both the flipper tetra instrument in a high throughput environment and we've also been able to use it on our Spectrumax and Paradigm i3 instruments which is a plate, you know, the plate reader platform. So one of the questions people have asked is, how is the dye working? And so there's a lot of calcium moving around in a cardiomyocyte. And so what happens is when you get the stimulus, when they get the stimulus to contract and they get an electrical signal from the other cells around them, you get a membrane depolarization and you get some, some smaller calcium channels opening and then calcium enters the cytosol and goes into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and causes a large calcium flux into the cytoplasm. The dye, we've, we've incubated the cells with the dye, and it's, so the dye is sitting in the cytoplasm, and when the calcium comes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's binding to the dye, and we're getting a large increase in signal. Then we have a decline in this concentration in the cytoplasm because you've got active transport of the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then also exchange with the extracellular fluid. And this causes a decline in cytoplasmic calcium concentration, which causes a decrease in the signal. And so you get decreased fluorescence. And of course, as the cells beat, the cycle repeats. So what we we offer is the binding of the dye to the calcium, and what we've done is we have um, made a kit that has the proven proprietary molecular devices masking technology in addition in addition to the, the dye, and this reduces extracellular background um, by masking uh, any non-specific things going on, which helps in it, which helps to enhance the calcium signal, and that makes it a, the signal larger. And then again, the minimal non-specific effect of dye on the beat characteristics helps to enhance the assay as well. This assay is quite robust. It's adaptable. You can do it in 96, 384, 1536, 
and it makes it possible to run earlier in the drug discovery process so that you can better prioritize your compounds. And of course, as we said before, it's good for working with the plate reader system and also on um, Flipitetra. So what does the kit contain? It has, each one has two vials of dye. There's two different sizes. One has an explorer size where each vial will do one plate. And the other one has a bulk size, which will do, has one, two vials, each vial doing five plates. The buffer, there's a, a buffer that's suitable for use with cardiomyocytes, and we've also included, because we're kind of at a new, a new stage and, and people would like to be able to have some quick um, and easy reference compounds, three reference compounds that demonstrate different characteristics when um, exposed to the, the cardiomyocytes. So a little bit about our reference compounds is propranolol is a non-selective beta blocker, and it slows peak frequency in um, calcium and cardiomyocytes. Photolol is used for treatment of arrhythmias, and it's also non-selective. In addition, it has some uh, effect upon uh, some of the potassium channels, and so it shows an altered beat pattern similar to what you see with herb channel blockers. And then the last one where we've got in the kit is isoproteranol, and again, it's a, um, it's an actually a beta adrenergic agonist that um, causes positive chronotropic and inotropic effects. And it gets used um, for treatment of slow heart rate, and it causes an increase in calcium peak frequency, so it, it speeds it up. So you can see on the right control at the top, you can see the, th the three different patterns when, control when compared to control. So just a little bit about the IPS-derived cardiomyocyte workflow. The cells that we are re talked about in this um, presentation were received from Cellular Dynamics International, and they were thawed and plated according to the CDI protocol at about 4,000 platable cells in a 384 well plate that's been pre-coated with gelatin. We've incubated the cells for 10 to 14 days with feeding. And the presence of strong synchronous contractions of cells in the wells under light microscope was confirmed before we tried to run the assays. And then on the flipper tetra system, um, we load the cells with dye for two hours. And then when we add it to the cells, we pre-warm the dye. And we prepare the instrument, um, setting up the protocol, and making sure that the tips and the compounds are warm as well. So there's a couple of ways of running an experiment. One, you can add the compound while measuring fluorescence on flipper. The other thing you can do is put the cells back in the incubator and read uh, compounds at different intervals, or we get a signal at different intervals. And then the analysis we've done is done using ScreenWorks Peak Pro software. So the Peak Pro software has various measurements and things that can be taken. You can look at signal amplitude, the peak frequency, the peak width at 10% amplitude, and these are the ones that we've worked with. But you can also look at rise time, decay time, uh, peak spacing, and we also have a feature that will um, identify irregular spacing as well. So this is this is a, a better look at the calcium peak frequency in untreated cardiomyocytes at 20 minutes um, post buffer addition in this case, um, so it's to match the compound addition. And the data is created. We took the um, sequence file from Flipper Tetra ScreenWork software and then exported it. And this one was actually made in GraphPad Prism, so you could take, you could just see the beat characteristics. So this is a closer look at propranolol. And we did approximately the EC, uh, IC50 of propranolol to look at the beat pattern. And um, the determined in this case from the change in beat frequency versus concentration of compound. And just to note, that in the, just because so many of our slipper customers are used to DPCR binding, um, the IC50 values aren't as tight as they might be with the DPCR. So they, they vary a little bit based on cell um, well, not quality, but from cell, cell well, or not wells, but from lot to lot, a little bit, and it depends on the con assay conditions. Isopaternal um, increases the peak frequency, and you can see here that it's going from about 18 uh, beats per minute to over 30. And uh, the kit enables the determination um, here, as we know, and we're looking at 
20 minutes per compound, but you can also um, look at this over time because one of the characteristics of the isoterno receptor or they desensitize the, the, the adrenergic receptor it desensitizes over time so the EC50 may, may shift over time. So there's a lot of things you can study. Sotolol is, is the last of the um, compounds. It is um, a non-selective beta blocker and what we, we again showed the uh, slowing of the beat rate and also you can see the, the altered beat pattern as um, at the IC50 concentration. So it's a very interesting um, drug and it also you know, depicts the different um, beat patterns that are similar to her. So we did another um, experiment and we wanted to take a look at the signal amplitude over time so that we could really look at the impact of the dye on average peak amplitude over, over a period of time. So uh, just a note, um, I started this uh, counting of the amplitude from the time that the buffer was added. And so there was a, a two-hour pre-incubation with the dye for uh, early tox cardio dye, but sulfur direct and calcium 5 were incubated for their protocols at one hour. And you can see that up to three hours that the amplitude for uh, the cardiotox kit really doesn't decrease. It increases a little bit over that time, but it, it doesn't decrease. Cardio or calcium 5 decreases uh, quite a bit, and over even a shorter period of time, you can see that sulforgic is gone by about 90 minutes. And the other thing we looked at was the impact of the dye over time on just cardiomyocyte beating. So these are uh, a number of, I had 34 control wells, and then we looked at them over, in this case, a four-hour period, and um, all of the dye wells that were in cardi the early tox cardiotoxicity dye, um, all of them remained beating up to four hours, and you can see that at uh, three hours, you get started to get a serious decrease with calcium 5 kit and, and gone at four hours. And then, again, an even more drastic effect with the flow 4 direct um, is gone. So the other thing we have is we have another diet, of course, that we've developed for use with DPCRs is the calcium 6 dye. And we wanted to show um, that this guy also um, has some silenced wells. So it's really a problem, similar problems um, to the different, different experiments. You can see that the number of wells decreases um, of it starting at about uh, three hours. It's starting to up to an experiment of six hours. You can see a significant number of silenced wells. And then um, uh, the cardiotox dye, again, showing um, little to no increase. It also has a bigger signal. So one of the things that we're, we were very excited to come across is the fact that the, um, with the nonspecific toxicity gone, that we were able to do assays that might run at a little bit slower pace. And so one of the things we have discovered is that you can use now the SpectraX Paradigm and I3 instruments to do some of these assays as well. So you, you use the same cell protocol to set up. Um, the, the plates, just like you would for a flipper. But in this case, um, you know, incubate with dye. You have to add your compounds offline, but um, you can go ahead and use these um, instruments. And we've developed a couple of uh, protocols, and they're in the protocol library in Softmax Pro 6. Um, they're called the um, cardiomyocyte beating I3 basic or I3, um, I think it's advanced. That has more more of the characteristics um, that we that we can look at. So as long as you pre warm the chamber, and then after your dye incubation and adding your compounds, you can go ahead and start reading. And because the instrument um, takes um, approximately two hours to incubate it to integrate a 384 well plate with lack of cytotoxicity. Um, it's really not a problem. So there's a couple ways you can do it. There's the one I just mentioned, and the other thing you can do is if you wanted to look at a, um, 
24-hour toxicity with drug is go ahead and load your drug 24 hours prior, and then at 22 hours, die load, and then you're ready to start reading um, at the 24-hour time point. So that makes it really nice for that particular reason as well, so you can see long-term effects of compound. So this is just an example of the kind of data that you're going to be getting from the I3 instrument. Each well here was read for about 25 seconds. And that's why it takes two hours during the play, because each one gets treated the same. But you can see that you can um, see the signal. And this is um, the, the peaks fluorescent with beating time. Um, and then it's, we're, we compared the RC50 of propranolol um, in this experiment to the one we did in the flipper experiment, and it's pretty close. So we're, we're pretty happy about that, too. So again, the minimal nonspecific toxicity of the early tox cardiotoxicity dye enables this particular assay to be run. So it gives you a lot of options if you're in a high throughput situation or if you're, you know, want to, want to use the I3 instrument, these um, assays are um, available. So I'm just going to kind of wrap things up and um, talk about the fact that the ability to predict cardiotoxicity earlier is enabled by our kit, and we're very excited about the fact that you can look at functional profiles in this with the, with the cells in a biorelevant cardiotoxicity assay. As we've talked about, the fact that we have nonspecific dye effects enables being able to run for long periods of time, um, both on Flipper and the Spectrumax um, I3 instrument. And you can see the largest signal available. And because of the short integration times, that is important. And as we said before, you can scale those assays from slate reader assay size to the high throughput. So thank you for um, listening to my portion of the talk. Now we're going to have um, Oksana present her part. Thank you, Carol, for that presentation. Uh, this is a reminder to everyone. We will answer all the questions after the conclusion of both presentations. But please do continue to send any questions through the Q&A window as we progress. In case you missed how we find that Q&A window, um, when I mentioned it previously, if you see the green bar at the top of your screen, uh, you can go up to that and select Options. And then you can select the uh, Q&A window. And from there, you can type in your question. And please be sure to select all panelists when sending through your question. Uh, and that way, we can all see the question um, and make sure that it gets answered. OK. And then I'm going to turn the presentation uh, control over to Oksana. Hello, thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar. So I'm Oksana Serenko, I'm a research scientist at Molecular Devices, and I will be talking today about assay development for drug toxicity screening using stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. Okay. So why these kind of studies are important? Prediction of toxicity effect of developing drugs and chemicals is one of the greatest challenges in industry. More than 30% of developing drugs fail for toxicity reasons, and also there is a growing concern of public about potential toxicity of variety of chemicals around us. So in vivo, animal toxicity testing is still the gold standard for toxicity screening, but those studies are time-consuming and costly, and more important, they may not always predict toxicity for humans. That's why development of alternative methods is extremely important, especially development of complex in vitro cell-based assays, which would provide complex information, which would reduce animal use and cost, will have increased high throughput, and also allow to evaluate mechanisms of toxicity. So stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes is an exciting new model which could be used for toxicity assessment. And uh, we developed assay which measures beating pattern of those cardiomyocytes. 
For our studies, we used ISO cardiomyocyte from Cellular Dynamics International, and we characterized the beating pattern by using calcium-sensitive dyes. Those stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes developed from small sample of donor blood they are reprogrammed into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then they can be differentiated into different types of cells, including cardiomyocytes. So on this slide, you can see uh, beating cardiomyocytes in culture. After several days in culture, they start beating. And in the beginning of our assay development, we try to monitor that mechanical movement of cells using imaging methods and sophisticated uh, analysis algorithms. But later on, we have found out that uh, using calcium fluxes is actually more robust and uh, easy method to monitor for, uh, um, to record and analyze beaten pattern. So as you can see here, cells in a culture, they form monolayer, and they started to beat synchronously. And you can see the synchronous ups and down of calcium fluxes, which is very impressive to observe. So here you can see three examples. So this is control cells, not treated with anything. So these cells are treated with epinephrine. So you can see speeding up of beating pattern. And also another sample of cells treated with verapamil, which slows down beating pattern. So those synchronous ups and down of fluorescent intensity, you can measure by imaging methods and also by other methods, by other instruments which have higher throughput, like sleeper instrument. So those intracellular calcium levels fluctuate with contraction, and they provide surrogate sort of assessment of the beating rate. So you can measure effect of the different compounds on a beating rate. So here in this example, you can see uh, several different compounds which uh, slow down uh, the beating rate, and those represent different types of compounds and different toxicity mechanisms, including HERC inhibitors, beta blockers, kinase inhibitors, or DNA damage. So all these uh, different kinds of uh, toxicity you can detect using this method. So to further develop this assay for high throughput mode, we um, needed to overcome three types of challenges. One challenge is to make this assay robust enough for high throughput screening. The second challenge is how to uh, take advantage of its complexity and uh, came out with multi-parameter characteristics of this uh, assay. And the third challenge was how to run compounds and how to do dot responses in statistics over this multiplexity and how to run in compounds for their toxicity. So we developed this assay for 384 well format and we run it on sleeper and each run uh, takes about two minutes so you measure uh, this all three to four wells simultaneously. So as you can see in this example, those cells were not treated with compound yet and you can see that it's pretty good uh, reproducibility across wells and also between the plates. You can see the beating rate and amplitude and other parameters are pretty consistent from well to well. So this assay is robust enough for the screening of compounds. To characterize this assay, we uh, screened uh, uh, cardiotoxicity library uh, from ENZO, which contains uh, 131 different compounds, which represent different classes of compounds. Uh, including antiarrhythmia, anti-cancer drug, anti-inflammatory compounds, neuroleptics, antibiotics, and other types. And they also represent different mechanisms of action, including blocking of ion channels, adrenal receptor antagonists, kinase inhibitors, and so on. So we run this multi-parameter cardiac toxicity assay at two time points. 
30 minutes and 24 hours across seven concentrations. And then we follow up this uh, plate with high content viability assay by imaging. So here you can see plate being treated with uh, uh, compounds and uh, this record is done 30 minutes after compound addition. So you can see the NSL controls are very consistent and positive controls, which is applied in this case, has very dramatic effect on a meeting rate. So you can see a variety of different kinds of effects. So those uh, testings are done in duplicates. So you can see complete blocking of effects with cardiac uh, glycosides. You can see speeding up of beating pattern with uh, isoproterenol, and you can see a variety of changes slowing down or changing pattern with number of other compounds from this library. So you, you are able to absorb different representative patterns for those compounds and cross concentration, including positive chronotrope. In this uh, um, case, you can see speeding up of beating pattern. So similar patterns you can see for isoproterenol, for example. You can see effects of negative chronotropes like uh, verapamil. So here you can observe slowing down of beaten pattern, so it's decreased beating rate, also increased distance between peaks and uh, decreased amplitude. A very characteristic pattern of Herc channel blockers. So in addition to a slowing down beating rate, you can see dramatic changes of beating pattern, which characterized by widening of the peaks and uh, increase of uh, peak decay time. So this is one of characteristic of Herc channel blockers, which inhibits the depolarization rate of cardiac potential. For sodium channel blockers, you can see lidocaine and several others, you can see uh, this increased distance between peaks and also appearance of irregularities. So to overcome this challenge of uh, taking advantage of the complexity of this assay, we develop uh, um, automated multi-parametric analysis of this beating pattern with flipper screen work with Peak Pro software. So this software can automatically um, analyze uh, beating patterns across number of selected parameters. So there is um, about 15 total and main of them are beating rate, also amplitude, um, space in between peaks, Decrease, rise time, decay time, assessment of regularity, and others. So this essay could be also followed up by regular uh, um, toxicity screening using calcium AM dye and that is stain, and we can count number of live cells using imaging methods. So in this example, um, you can see the fact of increasing dose of metatrix rate, and this was done 24 hours after treatment. So we evaluated this library uh, by the arbitrary uh, cutoff parameter where we use plus or minus three standard deviations from the MSO control across each parameter evaluated. So we find out that this assay has very good sensitivity and specificity, and its sensitivity actually increases if you use combination of parameters and not just beating rate. So from this library, we were able to um, define and characterize number of um, compounds in different groups, including cardiac glycosides, antiarrhythmia drugs, calcium blockers, adrenoreceptor antagonists, and also different kinds of um, cardiotoxic drugs like neuroleptics, kinase inhibitors, or anti-cancer drugs. So we characterize different parameters for their sensitivity versus specificity using different cutoffs for, uh, to qualify the heat rate. 
And we find out that most of parameters, especially bit rate and peak width as well as peak decay uh, time, has a very good uh, ratio between sensitivity and specificity. So this area under curve is um, pretty high, which means that uh, this assay both has high sensitivity and specificity. Some other parameters, like, for example, peak rise time has lower, relatively lower uh, sensitivity and specificity ratio. So we have done hierarchical clustering of, uh, uh, of these output parameters using beating rate and peak width across different concentration and different time points. That allow us, first of all, to uh, select out controls, which had uh, uh, negative controls, which were cardio-safe drugs can, included in a library, and uh, which had minimal effect on uh, the beating rate and the pattern. And we had uh, clustered uh, different types of um, drugs uh, based on similarity of their pattern. Uh, for example, you can see the similarities in a pattern which allow to cluster together uh, uh, antiarrhythmia drugs, anti-cancer drugs, neuroleptics, and interestingly, it also uh, allowed to get a hint about similarity of mechanism of action. For example, these tyrosine kinase inhibitors were clustered together with neuroleptics uh, which are um, which have an Herc blocker um, effect, and you can see that it was based on widening of peaks, which um, can hint of um, its activity and mechanism of action as a Herc blocker. So this complexity of analysis allows not only to uh, predict toxicity effect, but also get some information about possible mechanism of action. And the third challenge which we needed to overcome is how to rank the compounds and how to uh, make a dose response um, characterization over multiplex parameters. So dose response information is uh, obviously critical for safety ranking. And usually AC50 analysis is used for this purpose. But for toxicity effects, not all drugs or compounds, especially the ones which have moderate toxicity, able to um, reach plateau. So AC50 may be difficult to obtain in these cases. So for this purpose, we used a different method which was developed by Environmental Protection Agency for analysis of toxicity testing. So instead of AC50, a benchmark concentration could be used. So benchmark concentration is a concentration at which a certain parameter deviates from DMSO controls uh, over one standard deviation or other cutoff parameter which could be selected. So we apply this method to toxicity screening using multi-parameter uh, characteristics. Uh, so to rank compound, we use um, toxipy analysis. So this analysis based on uh, um, defining benchmark concentration across uh, multiple parameters. In this case, we use seven different parameters, which included beating rate, spacing, peak rise, decay time, peak width, and cell viability. And so this was defined as 30 minutes exposure, except cell viability, which was defined after um, 24 hours of exposure, since in 30 minutes most of um, um, compounds didn't have marked toxicity. And so the full pi means that those IC, that those benchmark concentration are high, so that this effect has, uh, this parameter is minimally affected by compounds. So something like maltol has no effect on beating, beating patterns, so all these benchmark concentrations are high. In another case, uh, where 
compound has very dramatic effect on uh, beating rate. Uh, majority of its parameters affected, and uh, at pretty low benchmark concentration. Okay. So on a pie diagram, it's uh, kind of represented like a small segment. So similar kind of analysis we have done after 24 hours of exposure, and uh, by the using a combination of those uh, uh, benchmark concentration across different parameters, we were able to rank compound for their safety or toxicity. So you can see that most of safe compounds were on the top when majority of uh, uh, cardiotoxic compound or cardioactive compound were uh, uh, scored low on toxicity testing. So this method not only kind of visual, but it could be very helpful to characterize uh, and rank the toxicity of compounds using multiplex parameters. So now um, I'm going to describe uh, some other development of these methods. So again, in this uh, uh, previous exercise, so our analysis and studies were limited to two time points, 30 minutes or 24 hours. So by using early tox cardiotoxicity dye, we able to greatly extend the assay window because this, this dye has minimum toxicity effect and it could be uh, cells, the uh, effect of compounds could be monitored up to six hours uh, after experiments start. And also, we find out that uh, this dye has minimal impact on a beating rate, and on this graph you can see a comparison of um, DMT done by visual observation just under microscope before addition of any uh, dyes or other uh, substances. And after addition of dye uh, measured on a flipper, so you can see that it's pretty consistent what's uh, going on before dye addition. And this decreased toxicity of um, calcium dye allow us to develop this assay using different instruments like plate reader. So you can read one well at a time and get a similar uh, pattern of uh, changes of fluorescent intensity. And now we have a um, program which also can get analysis of those uh, beating patterns. And in addition to uh, this analysis, you can monitor also for cell viability and morphology using Minimax addition to the plate reader. So you can do this toxicity assay and evaluate whether changes in a beating pattern caused by, the, uh, for example, um, some signaling uh, without uh, real toxic effect or that a particular uh, compound has uh, really cell toxicity effect like Dr. Rubicin or Starosporin in this case. So we can measure IC50s for peak count or other parameters using software and also we can measure um, IC50s using area covered by viral cells. So you can see these um, numbers and plots for number of representative compounds. So this essay or this instrument also could be used for uh, library screening, just it would take one time versus two minutes on flipper. But in fact, despite the fact that you run only uh, one well, at a time, this assay has a reasonable stability, so you can see DMSO controls here, and you can see a stack of different uh, uh, cardiotoxic compounds and on a beating pattern, and you can supplement this information with uh, um, this imaging data, which you can do on the same instrument, where you assess percent of live cells. So to assess assay variability on a plate reader, so we have done this um, evaluation. So again, 96 well could be run in 50 minutes when half plate runs in about uh, one hour and a half. But uh, despite that, uh, the effect of uh, on variability, so this is DMSO control, is very reasonable. 
and it has a little bit increased variability for amplitude, which slightly raise over the time. So to summarize uh, our presentation, so I would like to reiterate that the stem cell derived cell models offer very important advantages compared to traditional cell based model because of complexity and value of information they provide. But this assay also well suited to automatic screening environment. And uh, this high content data and multi-parametric analysis greatly increases assay sensitivity and provides important information about toxicity mechanism. And uh, finally, it's, uh, this assay system has significant predictivity and can facilitate high throughput safety screening of drugs and other agents. So I would like to acknowledge the scientists from molecular devices, especially Evan Cromwell and Deborah Galland, and also scientists from Cellular Dynamics International, as well as our academic collaborators, Ivan Rosen and Paul Johnson. And thank you so much for your attention. We would like to answer the questions. Okay, thank you, Oksana, for your presentation. Uh, let me just take back the host privileges, and we will move on to our last two slides. Okay, um, so we're going to begin the question and answer session now. As a reminder, to ask questions, if you're in the full screen view, you can uh, pull down that green bar at the top of your screen. Select options, select Q&A, and then you can send in your question in the box that uh, pops up. Please remember to select all panelists uh, so that we can all see the questions. Uh, I'll give us a minute to start compiling the questions. Okay. Okay, so one of the first questions we have that came in is, can you perform this assay on a Spectromax M5? Uh, can you take that? This is Carol. Um, we don't have the software on the Spectromax M5, I believe, to do any of the analysis. However, um, the reading is possible. The, so the Arendsen Softmax Pro 5 versus the i3 which runs the Softmax Pro 6. Okay. And then we also had a question that came in directly to us. It didn't go through the system. And that was a question about the definition of the relative light units. And that is something that is set as a, a measure of the fluorescence units within the instruments. So it's a relative arbitrary number, but what we're showing is the change between the two. And the y-axis is plotted from the soft, from the either SoftX Pro software or Springworks software, which shows the fluorescence intensity over time. So the fluorescence intensity is what's on the y-axis. Okay. Okay, then we're back to you. Thanks. Um, so one of the next questions that came in is, what is the sampling frequency uh, that the acquisition system has? So on the flipper tetra, it's 8 hertz. And on um, the Spectrumax i3? So on Spectrumax i3, this is 0.1 seconds. So this is usually sufficient to um, uh, resolve from the beating pattern for this particular assay. Okay. Uh, one of the next questions we have is, can you mention the number of cells you have seeded for this assay in a 96 well place? Yes. So actually, the seeding density is um, um, a little bit tricky question because it uh, depends on the standard protocol which provided by uh, 
um, the vendors. For example, uh, Cellular Dynamics International, they have uh, a pretty good protocol and recommendation for seeding density. Uh, so it's one thing which is important uh, to keep in mind that the uh, total cell number which you seed and platable cell number which um, kind of recommendation is um, um, two different things. So usually for 384 uh, format, we have like 4,000 per row of uh, platable cells, which usually mean 8,000 of vi total viable cells. And in 96 format, it would be roughly four times higher number. So it would be like around 16 to uh, 20,000 of platable cells or uh, almost like twice as much of total cells. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the next questions that came in is what kinds of offers work with this guy system? So we, um, in our, our kit, we include um, Delvecto's phosphine buffered saline plus 20 millimolar PEPIs, um, which is different from our calcium kits. And so we also have some customers that we talk to that are using different uh, buffers. So we would suggest that if you have a different buffer that you want to use with your particular cells, just do some um, assay development to make sure that you've got the system optimized for your buffer, and it should be fine. One important uh, thing here that uh, uh, the cardiac media, it doesn't contain glucose, so we don't want to use uh, buffers which contain glucose uh, for this assay. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question came in that asked us, um, if I, oh, I the first part of the question was, can you compare the cardiomyocytes from different culture conditions? Um, and then um, so they followed up with, is it possible to use this kit with a microsite reader um, from another company? Um, of course, you can use microsite readers from other companies. You'll have to check the parameters. Um, but the analysis is only available within Spectrum X um, software. Um, so it would be very difficult to take a look at things like rise time and other things um, without the SoftMax Pro software. And then another question was, uh, do you keep stable CO2 uh, during experiments? Um, we actually do not have the ability at this point to have stable CO2. Um, in the uh, flipper at all, um, we can warm the chamber, but in the um, Spectrum XI3 instrument, we um, can warm the chamber, but we do not. But the, the time parameters with the assay and buffer should keep the pH stable, so I don't think CO2 is necessary um, at this point. But as um, instruments continue to develop, um, that, that parameter may become available. So just to a little bit add, so during our um, essay development, we found that uh, critical parameter which does change uh, beating rate is uh, temperature. So it is really important to have uh, this uh, uh, deck of the instrument uh, pre-warmed to 37 degree and keep this temperature during the essay. So we actually were worried about CO2 changes, but we didn't um, detect any impact on this uh, beating rate in our experiment. So obviously for the flipper system, it's the reading time is short. It's less of an issue because we just put it back into incubator before the next read. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for just a couple more. Uh, so one of them is, what DNSO concentration was used on the IPS cardiomyocytes? Okay. 
So actually we have done studies um, and which included different um, DNA cell concentration and titration. So for our like, library screening, we use 0.1% uh, 0.1% of DMSO for all solution, and this uh, definitely doesn't have any impact on um, on a beating rate or cell viability. So we went up to 0.3%, also without any change. So we found that raising up to um, 1% may have effect of, uh, on cell viability, especially if you keep compounds for the long time. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question that came in is um, one that I don't think we've actually checked, but I think you guys can comment on the answers. What is the reaction potential of cardiomyocytes? We're not measuring the rest of the potentials in this type of experiment, but maybe you guys can expound a bit more on that. Oh, as you said, we're not measuring the resting potential here, um, but uh, that would be something that would be an you know, uh, electrophysiological parameter that we're, we're not looking at here. Okay. Um, another question that, that came in is that it seems like all the positive compounds eventually stop the beating of the cells. Is that the case? Excuse me, could you... Repeat the question again. Yeah, the question was, it seems like all the positive compounds eventually stop the beating of cells. Is that the case? Uh, positive, you mean uh, positive uh, the one which we had cardiotoxic. Yes, it is the case that uh, um, many of those cardiac toxic compounds uh, stop beating rate at higher concentration. But at lower concentration, same compounds were having just uh, moderate effect on a beaten rate, and it was um, presented on one of these IC50 plots where you can see gradual dose-dependent increase of beaten rate, not just stop. And, of course, many compounds had moderate effect, so they didn't uh, uh, stop the beaten rate, even at high concentration. Okay. Um, I think we've got time for two last questions. Um, so there's actually two that have come in that talk about the excitement platform. Um, one of them asks if we've used the plate from the excitement system to measure fluorescence in a spectrum device. Um, this plate has electrodes at the bottom. And I guess the question is, is it possible for us to be able to read it in the spectrum act? Uh, it's, uh, I, I don't think that would be kind of reverse plates would be very suitable for spectrum marks and uh, for our studies we just use regular corning or grainer plates which um, um, uh, covered or kind of treated with 0.1% uh, of gelatin. So, and uh, Excelligen, this is different platform, so maybe not the most suitable uh, material. Yeah, and since I have some experience with a similar type of plate, I think we don't actually know um, how the gold electrode, if there would be any uh, reflection that would interfere with fluorescence or not. Um, and certainly depending on if you're doing top or bottom read, um, there could maybe be some interference from the bottom read, but it's not something that we've really looked at. Um, and then following up on that also about the exhaustion system with um, have we done any assays to look at beating pattern and frequency uh, and how, of our assay, and if it's close or comparable to what uh, people have seen from the intelligence platform? Yes, this is absolutely right question. So when we published um, our uh, like source paper on this uh, method development, of course uh, we used all these um, excelligent papers as our kind of uh, reference list. So we studied those very um, carefully, and I think it's uh, kind of very reasonable. Uh, uh, concordance between uh, data, and so it's a different platform, but since it's measuring the same uh, um, event, 
So obviously, like beating rate could be measured, and impact on beating rate. How to compare data? It's uh, kind of it depends on particular uh, compounds, and obviously we have um, analysis platform which is very different from what they use for intelligent readouts. Okay. Um, so I think that's all the time we have for questions today. I know there's some questions we didn't get to. Uh, we will go back and pull that list of questions, and we will uh, directly answer them to the submitters. Uh, one question, though, that did come up more of a housekeeping question is, uh, will the slides be available for download? Um, so I think what we will be doing is we'll be sending out an email to all the attendees with a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, and then if you'd like to request the slides at that point, uh, we can do that on a uh, case-by-case basis. Um, so certainly feel free to send in that request after uh, you get the link to the webinar. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to leave the WebEx open for about five minutes um, after we conclude, and you can continue to submit any additional questions that you have. Uh, so we will be sure to get back to you um, within probably the uh, next couple of days to a week uh, to respond to any questions we haven't had time to respond to here today. So before concluding today's webinar, I'd like to invite you to visit the event page on moleculardevices.webex.com. Uh, there you'll be able to review both this webinar and future reagent kit webinars. Uh, you can also find webinar series for all of our product lines. Uh, so we have them for uh, quite a number of products. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar in a few days. It will actually be in our assays and reagent kit webinar. There'll also be a link to it from our website. Uh, but you guys will also get an email uh, to that day sharing the link with you. So this concludes today's webinar. I'd like to thank Carol and Sana for their presentation. And on behalf of Marshall Devices, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today. We look forward to seeing you at future events, and we hope that you have a pleasant day. Thank you very much. <laughs>